Human rights are the rights you have simply because you're human. It's how you instinctively expect and deserve to be treated as a person, like the right to live freely, to speak your mind, and to be treated as an equal. At first, there were no human rights. If you were in with the right crowd, you were safe. If you weren't, well, you weren't. But then a guy named Cyrus the Great decided to change all that. After conquering Babylon, he did something completely revolutionary. He announced that all slaves were free to go. He also said people had the freedom to choose their religion, no matter what crowd they were a part of. He documented his words on a clay tablet known as the Cyrus Cylinder. And just like that, human rights were born. The idea spread quickly to Greece, to India, and eventually to Rome. They noticed that people naturally followed certain laws, even if they weren't told to. They called this natural law, but it kept getting trampled on by those in power. Not until a thousand years later in England did they finally get a king to agree that no one can overrule the rights of the people, not even a king. People's rights were finally recognized and they were now safe from those in power. Kind of. It still took a bunch of British rebels declaring their independence before the king got the point that all men are created equal. Which isn't to say he liked the idea, but he couldn't stop that, and America was born. The French immediately followed with their own revolution for their own rights. Their list was even longer, and they insisted that these rights weren't just made up. They were natural. The Roman concept of natural law had become natural rights. Unfortunately, not everyone was so thrilled. In France, a general named Napoleon decided to overthrow the new French democracy and crown himself emperor of the world. He almost succeeded, but the countries of Europe joined forces and defeated him. Human rights was again a hot topic. They drew up international agreements, broadly granting many rights across Europe, but only across Europe. The rest of the world somehow still didn't qualify. Instead, they got invaded, conquered, and consumed by Europe's massive empires. But then a young lawyer from India decided enough was enough. His name was Mahatma Gandhi, and in the face of violence, he insisted that all people of Earth had rights, not just in Europe. Eventually, even Europeans started to agree. But it wasn't going to be that easy. Two world wars erupted. Hitler exterminated half the Jewish population of Earth in horrifying Nazi death camps. And all told, 90 million people died. Never had human rights been so terrifyingly close to extinction. And never had the world been more desperate for change. So the countries of Earth banded together and formed the United Nations. Their basic purpose was to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights in the dignity and worth of the human person. But what were human rights? Were they the proclamations of Cyrus, the natural laws of Rome, the declarations of France? Everyone seemed to have a slightly different idea of what human rights should be. But under the supervision of Eleanor Roosevelt, they finally agreed on a set of rights that applied to absolutely everyone. The Universal Declaration of human rights. The French concept of natural rights had finally become human rights. And one of the most significant artifacts of Cyrus's reign is the Cyrus Cylinder. The Cyrus Cylinder is widely regarded as the world's first charter of human rights. It was created over 2,500 years ago by King Cyrus the Great, and it reflects his commitment to justice, fairness, and equality was one of the most powerful empires in ancient history. It was known for its vast territories, rich culture, and remarkable leaders. However, popular media portray all Persian kings as cruel. This is far from truth. And one of the most prominent figures in Persian history was King Cyrus the Great. Cyrus was born in 590 BCE in Persis, a region in modern-day Iran. He became the king of Persia in 559 BCE, at the age of 31. And during his reign, he expanded the Persian Empire to become the largest empire in the world at the time. But Cyrus was not just a conqueror. He was also known for his benevolent rule and his respect for the diverse cultures and religions within his empire. He promoted the use of local languages and customs, and allowed for freedom of movement and religion. 
he recognized the importance of cultural preservation and respected the diversity of the peoples he ruled. The text on the cylinder is written in Akkadian, a language used in ancient Mesopotamia. It states that Cyrus allowed the people of Babylon to practice their own religions and traditions, and that he restored their temples and other cultural sites. It also abolished slavery and encouraged freedom of movement and religion. The principles of human rights that Cyrus championed over 2,500 years ago are reflected in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted in 1948. The Cyrus Cylinder is a powerful symbol of the enduring importance of human rights. It reminds us that the principles of justice, fairness, and equality have been championed for thousands of years and that they continue to inspire us today. Next, we'll be exploring one of history's earliest known written constitutions, the Medina Charter. Also called the Constitution of Medina, this groundbreaking document was created by the Prophet Muhammad in 620 CE. It was designed to unify the diverse communities of Medina, which included Muslims, Jews, and various tribal groups, into a single, peaceful society. The Medina Charter is remarkable because it outlines principles of governance, community cooperation, and security in a way that promoted inclusivity and coexistence. First, it established a unique concept at that time, unity among diverse groups. Under the charter, every member of Medina, regardless of religion or tribe, was considered part of a single community, or Ummah. This was a groundbreaking approach to building a unified society. Religious freedom was another key feature. The charter explicitly granted freedom of belief and practice, especially for Jewish tribes, allowing each community to follow its own religious laws and customs without interference. In an era where religious tolerance was rare, this was a significant step toward mutual respect among different groups. The charter also addressed security and mutual defense. All groups in Medina were required to stand together in defending the city from outside threats, fostering a sense of shared responsibility for the well-being of the community. Justice was central to the Medina Charter. It laid out a framework for resolving disputes fairly, with Muhammad serving as a neutral mediator when needed. This helped maintain peace and establish Medina as a place of justice for all its inhabitants. Finally, the charter promoted non-aggression and mutual respect, prohibiting acts of treason and alliances with enemies. This helped build a society based on trust and cooperation. In many ways, the Medina Charter can be seen as a precursor to some of today's core human rights principles, such as freedom of religion, equality under the law, and collective security. It remains a powerful example of how early societies work to build peaceful, inclusive communities, values that still inspire us today. The Magna Carta in 60 Seconds Law Simplified by Hisham el Rafay. The Magna Carta, or the Great Charter, was a historic document issued in 1215 in England during the reign of King John. It played an essential role in developing constitutional law and individual rights as it limited the monarchy's power and contributed to the development of modern democratic systems and the rule of law. The key points of the Magna Carta can be summarized as follows. The king must follow the law and is not above it. No one, including the king, can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without a fair legal process. Taxes and fines must be reasonable and not excessive. Free access to justice in a fair trial by peers is guaranteed. Protection of individuals from unlawful detention and the right to a prompt trial or release. Protection of merchants from illegal seizure of property. The king cannot impose arbitrary punishments or imprison people without a legal basis. The law should be administered impartially and fairly, regardless of status or position. The rights of the church and its leaders are to be respected without interference by the king. And lastly, the king must seek his barons' consent before imposing taxes or making significant decisions. Magna Carta was not an immediate success, and some of its clauses were later revised or removed. However, its principles of limiting government power, protecting individual rights, and upholding the rule of law have had a lasting impact on constitutional development in many countries worldwide. By the early 1770, more and more American colonists became convinced that the British Parliament intended to take away their freedom. Abandoned of all hopes of reconciliation with Britain, they appointed Thomas Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence. The preamble justifies the colony's separation from Britain, addressing both King George and potential European allies who might support their cause. Jefferson then moves to the document's most famous and influential passage. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator 
with certain unalienable rights. This is a clear example of natural rights theory. To call this a massive statement would be a gross understatement. Jefferson basically says that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are given to people by their creator. That means rights do not originate from the government or a king, which further means that these natural rights cannot be taken away by the government. In fact, the whole reason people create governments is to look over and protect their natural rights, which is exactly what Jefferson says next. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So, to protect natural rights, people create government, and the government gets its power from the consent of the governed, basically, the people. Jefferson also accounts for the fact that governments may break this social contract and infringe on the people's rights. He writes that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. This established the revolutionary principle that people have not only the right but the duty to overthrow governments that fail to protect their natural rights. Jefferson laid the cornerstone of modern democratic thought. This principle, that government exists to serve its people, not rule over them, would become the foundation of American democracy and inspire constitutional governments worldwide. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, approved by the National Assembly of France, August 26, 1789. It is a central document of the French Revolution and fundamental to the history of both civil and human rights. The Declaration relies heavily on the Enlightenment philosophy of natural rights, or rights that are universal and inalienable for all individuals, and embodies the French Revolution ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity. These principles affirm that all people are born free and equal, with distinctions allowed only for the common good. The purpose of government is to protect fundamental rights liberty, property, security, and the ability to resist oppression. Sovereignty resides with the people, and authority must derive directly from them. True liberty allows individuals to act freely, so long as they harm no one else. Laws are created by the general will to prevent harmful actions, and individuals can't be forced to act outside the law. Citizens are entitled to participate in lawmaking and are equal before the law, with access to public roles based on merit. No one may be detained or punished without legal cause, and all are presumed innocent until proven guilty. Freedom of expression is protected, so long as it doesn't disrupt public order. Public forces exist solely to protect citizens, funded by fair taxation according to means. Citizens have a right to know how taxes are used and to influence their collection and allocation. Officials are accountable to the public, and a legitimate constitution depends on enforced laws and a clear separation of powers. Property rights are sacred and can only be infringed upon for public necessity, with fair compensation. These principles envision a fair society where laws protect rights, ensure justice, and balance individual freedoms with the public good.